For 125 years, SCO Family of Services has been helping children, families, and communities throughout New York City and Long Island to grow and to thrive. We work in communities and with communities to improve lives and open doors to opportunities. We believe in the power of resilience. We invite you to join us in our important work. everyone. Welcome to our fourth annual CARE Talks event. Uh, my name is Tracy Olsina and I serve as co-chair of CARE, Committee Advocating for Racial Equity, and I also serve at SEO as an incident manager. I'm so excited today to welcome you to our fourth CARE Talk event and our first time ever making it public. I know we have many organizations with us today, so please remember to share your name and your organization, and we have the instructions on the screen below. All participants right now are currently muted. If you have a question, please use our chat function. I'll be moderating that. And feel free to raise your hand during the event. This, oh, this event is being recorded, so please refrain from disclosing private client information. And now I'm introducing my co-chair, Danielle. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm so happy to see that so many of you took the time out of your Friday to join us here. Uh, I'm very excited to introduce our keynote speaker today, um, Dr. Milan. Dr. Milan has earned her doctorates of psychology in clinical psychology from the California Institute of Integral Studies, a master's in counseling and community agencies from New York University's Steinhardt School of Education, and her bachelor's of arts in psychology and elementary education from New Jersey City University. She believes it is essential to create dialogue to address how mental health is deeply affected by systemic inequities and the trauma of oppression. She has almost 15 years of experience in clinical practice, higher education, teaching, and grant writing. She is passionately committed to solidarity work that effectively addresses inequities based on race, gender, class, ability, gender identity, and sexual orientation. Uh, without further ado, please welcome Dr. Milan. Good morning, everyone. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you so much, Danielle. Thank you, everyone, for the introduction. It is an absolute pleasure. Um, although we are virtual, I will do my best to continue in a manner that would allow us to feel connected and contained. Um, uh, my again, my name is Jennifer Mullen. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. 
Um, as I begin this workshop, what I think is important to communicate is that this is going to be a lot of uh, an overview um, and brief little snippets throughout that are going to touch upon pieces that I believe and I hope are going to connect very deeply to many of the areas in which you work. Um, throughout this hour that we have together, I in no way, shape or form am going to be able to cover every little angle and bit, but I will be doing my best to ensure that we cover the areas that are most affected and impacted, particularly by the recent violences and the 400 plus years of violence that many of us have already been conscious of and aware of um, on brown, black and indigenous bodies. Um, the purpose of this presentation as well is to highlight the ways in which it would be very beneficial for all of us to continue to, as we say, politicize our practice. And when I speak of politicizing our practice, um, what I mean is really bringing in an understanding and, and looking at the whole picture, not just the individual who we're treating, but the systems that are interlocking around the individuals and the families and the youth that we're treating. So let's get started, I'm excited. Um, please, as, as, they, as you already know, place any questions down below or write them down. We'll have a question and answer period later. I find it essential um, to really, really acknowledge the land that we are on. Um, many of us, including myself, are settlers. Um, so I am residing um, on Lenape land, I'm right at that little, uh, you know, the, the river line um, in the Jersey City area. I'm looking at a lot of you in the New York area and I say hello. Um, so as we're on Lenape land, it is really, really crucial to remember that these were the individuals that occupied this land before Europeans um, arrived. And it was known to many as Lenape o King. Um, and it's covered roughly most of the area between New York, New Jersey and Philadelphia, and actually all of New Jersey, some parts of Eastern Philadelphia and Delaware. And again, we may be wondering why this is important to do. Um, because if I am talking about decolonization, right, it's not just a metaphor. And I provided you some amazing resources at the end that you can look back on to, to understand a little bit more about decolonization, more so than what I'm going to get into. Um, the other important piece um, in my cultures and traditions and my people's lands is something that we say, which is en la quech. And that just simply means I am you, you are me and we are us. So when I present, if you can't tell already, uh, I'm a very relational person. It's important for me to not only connect with you and learn from you, but have you connect and learn with me and then us connect and learn from each other. Um, so I think that three way learning is one of the ways that we can best uh, learn together, grow together and aspire to be better clinicians, mental health care workers and better resources and access to, to the families in which we serve. And with that, I really wanna thank SVO Family Services for bringing me on board and asking for this conversation to happen. Um, thank you in particular to the care team, the entire committee advocating racial equity. Um, all of you, thank you so much for allowing this to happen and all the behind the scenes work. Um, thank you, Christina Calabrese. Thank you, Tracy Ocina, Danielle Wilson, um, for your countless hours, <laughs> even prior to today, and all, the, all of your patience. And of course, also thank you to President and CEO Keith Little. It is my pleasure to be here. Okay, moving on. Um, so there was already a beautiful introduction, no need for me to go into a further one. But what I do think it is really, really important to talk about is why I'm into <laughs> decolonizing therapy practices and how it is extremely different than social justice, right? Yeah, social justice should be embedded in the core of what it is we do. But when we also speak about decolonizing our therapeutic and mental health practices, whether or not you know we're the staff and the team on the ground all the time with the youth when they come into the residential, whether we're the admin assistants greeting the families as they're coming in, it is conscious for us to have the frame that the folks that we're serving don't necessarily want right to be in these systems. Right, and, and as somebody who worked at UMDNJ's partial care unit, um, Mercy First, shout out to all my Mercy First people. I was an intern there, I was a doctoral intern. Um, I was on um, ATPP. 
um, abuse treatment prevention program. How do I still remember that from 10 years ago? Um, you know, being on these units and residentials, working in outpatients, now working in a counseling center that pretty much is community mental health, working in the inner, working with students from Jersey City and Newark, Union City. I am not just treating that one person. I am treating their family systems, whether or not I'm aware of it and whether or not they're in the room. I'm also working with and trying to help bring healing, not just treating. And that's part of um, politicizing and decolonizing our practices as well, is looking at language, right? Looking at language, words like Termination, which we all use, including myself. I can't tell you how many termination um, notes I've written um, down to looking at the words such as treating, which is extremely medical model. I'm not saying that these things are wrong. I'm saying that, and many of us are saying that are doing this work, that it may be time to do it differently because so many of our youth and families, particularly living in black and brown bodies, are dying. And we're not just dying due to our own devices as systems and news outlets would like us to believe. Um, we're also dying at the hands of police. We're dying at the hands of um, a mental health system and a, and a healthcare system that is not always taking into account the whole individual and the environmental stressors and traumas that continue to plague our communities, our bodies, our minds, even our spirits. So I am doing this work because it is um, my belief and many others that are doing this work and whose shoulders I sit and reside upon, that it is time to do it different. I am a critical lover of therapy. I love being a psychologist. And there are some things throughout the years that um, I have noted within group work and individual that are no longer working. So my why is I would like for um, our black youth to stop being murdered. My why is I would like so many beautiful families across the world to be reunited and not be detained and sent back to their countries by ICE. Um, and I think that many of you feel the same way. I would also like for my mental health professionals and I to stop feeling so burned out right, which I, what I call capitalism fatigue. Um, it is really, really exhausting to hold so much trauma. Um, so my hope is that this work would allow more space and time for our communities, as well as more space and time for us to continue to be healthier and more grounded. Um, so a brief overview, and again, I will just be touching on various areas. Each of these can be their own workshops, truly. Um, so there's going to be a brief overview of race and poverty, um, and then a brief overview, and I'm going to define for everyone decolonization and what colonization is, um, because these, not that we're not intelligent, but I think many of us are wondering, what does this history of colonization, what does it have to do with mental health, and what does it have to do with me on the front line, busting my behind every day, right? Um, so that's going to be my job, is to help bridge some of that for you. We're gonna be looking at historical trauma and grief just a little bit and a little baby bit about intergenerational trauma as well, right? As well as what does that really look like to decolonize some of our mental health practices and whether or not that is possible. I will also leave you with some resources and some trainings that you can take on your own. <clears throat> so getting started, yeah, moving along. So normally allow me to say that I start this uh, workshop or keynote really talking about the past, but something told me, no, let's start at the present. Let's start at where we are now. Um, so if we really look at race, one of the things that I often encounter as somebody who's been a community organizer for years and someone who has learned, even as a clinician, so much from younger community organizers about racism, oppression, xenophobia, dot, 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 we can keep going. I learned that not having an inclusive definition of the terms that we're talking about often creates more discord and dis-ease. I've often sat in rooms with other people um, that are brilliant saying, no, this is what the definition of race is. No, this is what the definition of race is. <laughs> and honestly, that ends up wearing us out and dividing and conquering us, which 
if we look at history, has been a tactic in use for many, many years, even with our white body brothers and sisters and individuals, right? Um, so if we look at racism, the definition that I'll be using comes from dismentallyracism.org as well as um, People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. So it, it would need, in order for someone to engage in racist behavior individually, the definition I'm using is that there would be racial prejudice plus social and institutional power. Yeah, mouthfuls. In other words, someone has to walk in the world as a person of color, whatever that means to you, whether there are South Asian siblings or whether somebody is indigenous, um, some level of racial identity and prejudice. And then there has to be some level of social and institutional power. And therein comes the question, who has the power? Yeah, right? Who has the power? Who gets to make decisions? So even if we're um, directors and supervisors, are there people above that are making decisions? And even if we're CEOs, who are making decisions above that, right? So many times people of color are in positions of power but really, when we unpeel that layer, there's very little power and there's a real risk of being um, pushed out or pushed in the box, as we call it, like a jack in the box. Um, so racism is a system of oppression. And many of us and many of the people that we serve know it and feel it and don't always have that definition. And that, that's OK, right? Um, so many people living in Black, brown bodies understand what it's like, unfortunately, prior um, to the murders of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd, we are really, really conscious of the talk you might need to have with your black and brown children before they go out at night, yeah? Very familiar with the anxiety that we may feel if we're having a cookout, right? So as these cases continue to escalate, as we had Philandro Castile being murdered, in his car, with his family, with a child in front of him, someone that could be like you and me, right? Someone that was taking care of youth and working with youth. I don't know about you, but I felt that deeply, deeply. Um, and it just continued to fuel the importance of all of us, even if we walk in visibly melanated bodies <laughs> or visibly black or brown bodies. Um, it is it's crucial that we also have a bit of an analysis. Yeah, it's crucial that we understand that racism is also upheld by history, right? Our, our society is informed by centuries of habits and biases and disparities. I know that's really tiny, but this is a great slide because our racism is also upheld by systems. When we talk about systemic oppression and racism, we're also talking about the system of white supremacy. So when, when we speak about white supremacy, I'm not talking about, you know, my friend next to me who is white person. I'm talking about a system that has continued to give white friend perhaps some unearned privileges that I have not received and not made things quite as equitable and made things harder on numerous levels. And that is often very unconscious. Many of us do not want to do harm on each other, right? But this process is dehumanizing. It is dehumanizing for white body people and it's also dehumanizing for people of color. Racism is also upheld by privilege, right? And privilege is very difficult to notice because when we have it, we don't see the problem. Right? We don't see the problem until people we care about or people we love um, or something really big on the media or the news happens and we're like, wow, this is, this is not okay. Or we've already been doing this work and engaged in this work. But privilege um, is also difficult to address, right? If, if anybody has ever been shut down in meetings or saying something, I've been in meetings saying something over and over and over and then someone that looks very different from me and much more white presenting will say something. And I'm thinking, I think I just said that. Did I, that, what happened? Or, or being um, not seen or heard in some places, which is really triggering. Um, microaggressions are also another way that racism is upheld, right? And these are everyday slights. Um, now I could spend, I, and I teach multicultural counseling at numerous universities and I spend often 
whole class on microaggressions, on history, on systems. So let me just say that I am deeply skimming here, but I wanted to start off making sure that we had clear definitions and that we understand that race is a social and political concept, right? Race is a construct, my people, right? It was created by Blumenbach and Buffant and the British aristocracy in the 1700s. And that's another workshop for another time. It was based on skull sizes, yeah? From Caucasoid to Mongoloid to Oscaloid to Negroid, yeah? And you can imagine that the researchers were from the Caucasus mountains of Europe and identified the largest school size as the Caucasoid side, um, size, excuse me, which is why many organizers that are white bodied and white identifying choose to not identify as Caucasian anymore, I am told, um, because of this icky history with race and skull size. Now that doesn't mean that race doesn't affect us though. Kind of how money is arbitrary and it's just paper, but money is a thing, yeah? <laughs> the same thing with race. Race very much affects us, but it is important to understand um, that the term, even the term white was constructed to unite various European groups. So people that have come to identify as white, it's important to understand that you did not become white at the same time. There is a history to this. Um, so whether you're Italian, Jewish identified, Irish, Czechoslovakian, right? Becoming white involves giving up parts of our original culture. Um, and, and again, this could have been passed down. This isn't like we consciously were aware of this, but in order to gain advantages and privileges. And back in the day, some of those advantages and privileges were just survival, coming to the new world, right? Getting a job. Um, but today, it may take on a very different um, theme and flavor. Um, so I wanna remind you, yeah, like this is a, a very heavy topic and one in which many of us are living out on consistent basis. Um, for some of us, if this is making you uncomfortable, just notice it. There's a difference between unsafe and uncomfortable. Yeah, and also notice um, for those of you that are living in um, people of color bodies, that this is also something that we understand very well and we've internalized and we've had to learn, even if you haven't had these words for it. Um, this has been part of our process of survival. Um, so white supremacy, when we talk about this, so the idea that white people and the thoughts, ideas, and beliefs and actions of white people are superior to those of people of color. Now, usually, as I said, this happens systemically, yeah, systemically. And um, we see this in disparities in education system, right? People with wealthier zip codes, usually um, they're white identified individuals, usually um, have education that is better. The kids have new computers, new books. Right? And we also see this when a young black athlete um, has locks. And I think a lot of you might've seen that and they're ready to do a wrestling match. And I think the referee, sorry, I'm not a sports person, um, started to shave their head off. Right? That is an act of violence. He might not have physically harmed him, but he touched his person. And the belief was that having locks was inherently or in some way bad or wrong or you know, something to be punished for. So when we talk about supremacy, we're not talking about individual acts of racism. We're talking about institution, systems, ideas, and beliefs that our very world is structured on. Um, and it's okay to take some breaths during this, yeah? Um, you know, some of us may be very, very familiar with this material. And for some of us, this may feel um, a bit overwhelming. And so those of us that work in the mental health fields, we're aware that it's so crucial to be able to slow down and to notice what is triggering us, to notice what is activating us, and to think about why we're having this conversation and why our mental health, psych psychology, social work, psychiatry fields, are moving this way, yeah? So collective socialization, um, why I'm bringing this up soon after talking about white supremacy and race, and I know we started off pretty heavy and with a bang, um, we have been collectively socialized, yeah? Another word for this um, could be brainwashed, right? Or unconsciously led, us, led to. Um, collective socialization are the places in which 
we believe and we are told that this is good and right and this is icky bad out of the box and so i would love for you to think of a multitude of examples within yourself in which media school even your beloved family members have told you things that you do not necessarily resonate with in your body or your mind or your actions. And I'd love for you to think of some of the practices, right? That continue to keep us thinking in this box, right? What are some of the ways, like in school, let's say you liked coloring outside of the lines when we have elementary age students and the teacher keeps saying color in the lines, color in the lines. Um, the teacher is not bad. The teacher is doing what they've been taught. We're been, we've been doing what we've been taught. Sit still, don't get out of your chair. Um, you know, when you're talking to adolescents or little children, that's really, really hard to do. It's hard to do for some of us. I believe, I believe probably some of us now are doodling, doing other things, checking our phone. It's very difficult for many of us, specifically in the age of a pandemic and so much violence at this time, to just feel calm. So it's interesting that we place these on people with less power than us, particularly our children, right? So when we have been collectively socialized, it's important for us to look at the way that policies, resources, time and money have all been allocated to keep us, our beliefs and our thoughts in some sort of box or in line, so to speak. So I really enjoy that little meme. It says, the longer you swim in a culture, the more invisible it comes, um, it becomes. And, and that in a very silly meme nutshell is why we are talking about decolonizing therapy um, because our, our feels and our theories, um, although very useful, are also sometimes not translating. I may even dare say with a great deal of respect, a bit archaic, um, many of the people that created these theories um, were cisgendered, right? Um, they were white bodied, they were heterosexual, and that's fine. That's perfectly fine. But there were also other people that have been, been creating amazing theories throughout the world that we have not been learning in our schools. And so I think that that's important to look at as well. So moving along, what I, what I do think is important is that we understand that it is not just about race. I have no doubt that the people that you're working with and serving are not just black and brown bodied, yeah? Um, I will have no doubt that class has a great deal to do with the lack of resources, education, not having enough jobs. So as therapists and mental health workers and the people on the front lines with these families and staff, yeah, what we may see is a lot of the left side, right? But what we don't ask ourselves are why are people poor, right? And why are we not understanding about the level of poverty for even white bodied people? So uh, many times when I ask folks, who do you think are the number one welfare recipients in the United States? People often kind of freeze and they're like, well, Mexican or black or Puerto Rican. Those are usually the answers that I receive. Um, but the fact remains is that the number one the number one race recipient of welfare are white women. Yeah. So again, going back to collective socialization, my friends, going back to looking at white supremacy as a system, right? Again, not individual acts. I feel like I have to say that over and over, especially for people that are very like taken aback by the term. Um, it is an academic term. Yeah, and it's a very political term. So yes, we've heard that these are the reasons of why people are poor, but many times we're not also taking to account that when we're off the clock or, when we're, or, or our family members or people that we care about, even unconsciously there's a bias and the right side of this list often comes up. Oh, these people are getting services or on welfare or, or at SCO or Mercy First or anywhere else because of they're just bad choices. They made millions of bad choices. Yeah. Um, they're just living off the system. And, and again, many of us have said and believe these things, including myself, when I'm not catching myself. It might even be about people that we care about in our own communities and our own hoods and our own neighborhoods. Right? So it's really important that we understand and we take into account that there are also wealthy people 
that are unemployable and lazy and make bad choices and have poor planning and live off the system, <laughs> right? There are many, many people um, that are not in black and brown bodies that also um, are dealing with a lot of these issues. So it's important for us when we talk about race and we talk about systemic oppression and decolonizing that we're not just looking at one side of that list and not just going from what we believe. Instead, it is crucial that we look at systems, yeah? And that is what mental health and behavioral health really would benefit from is continuing to look at how school systems have a pipeline that go into the prison system, right? To be, continue to look at how, um, you know, our queer and non-binary youth continue to feel not seen and heard in many residential units or school systems or healthcare clinics, yeah? And all they want to do is be who they are. So if, if we just took an example and look at systems and we looked at the education system, the question is, and I would recommend if you're in behavioral health that maybe in your team meeting, that one of the next steps that you do is ask, hey, how does behavioral health or how does mental health, how does residential health, how is what we're doing unconsciously and unknowingly, because I know all of us are doing this because we care about people. Right? You're not doing this work because you're forced to, like you actually have a good intention in what you're doing. And so the consciousness is how does the system, maybe not me, but how does the system exploit, exclude, or underserve poor people and many people of color? Um, and with that, you would also want to ask eventually, how am I and acting and employing some of these systemic ways that um, are harming our people. So if we look at the education system, just as an example, yeah, um, curriculum, who is included in the curriculum? The history that I'm just gonna briefly touch upon in a minute, or your history was um, South Asian identities and history talked about in your school. Probably not. <laughs> um, was Ghanaian history and life and the thriving Mecca that Africa and Ghana and Nigeria and Kenya were even prior to Timbuktu? The creation of mathematics, was any of that taught in your school? And for some of you say yes, beautiful. That is beautiful and that's a form of privilege as well. That's amazing access to information that you've needed and received. Many of us have had to claw our way through trying to figure out who are we? You know, if I'm a black American, does that mean I'm African? Am I African American? Am I not? I mean, I'm treated differently. And it's really complicated. If I identify as Caribbean from the Caribbean, you know, do I see myself as a black American? Do I not want to be seen as a black American? And that's a whole other conversation around anti-blackness and we can get into that eventually. Um, but for now, I would really love for us to look at you know, this education system, diagnosing and labeling is a way that children are exploited and excluded. Um, tracking, standardized testing. Who does standardized testing work for, by the way? Um, a lack, a deficit of black, indigenous, brown teachers and administrators, you know, large class sizes. These are all ways that the education system, consciously or not, as a system continues to maintain the structure of white supremacy. Um, so moving on, sorry, this is a bit slow moving. Um, the other piece that I would like to point out <clears throat> are that many teachers are also stuck within this cycle, yeah? And so teachers often don't have enough art um, supplies. Um, dance classes are cut, gym classes are cut. Right, there's lack of play and a big overemphasis on doing the worksheets, reading things about it. Um, so it's really crucial that we also understand that teachers, if we looked at the education system, are also being exploited in the system. So mental health, right? Many of us might've heard of racial trauma, which very much comes from race-based traumatic stress coined by Ron Ironman and many others that have been doing amazing work. Um, so just to be clear, race-based traumatic stress 
is part of this a deep pain that a person feels after encounters with racism. And I would dare add classism because I do believe that they're inextricably linked. Yeah, that you really, race does not exist without a class analysis. Like, um, and that's a whole other conversation for us to talk about. <laughs> um, but many people after racist encounters, and those could be microaggressions, things like, oh, I, I didn't know that you were a doctor. Good for you. Okay. Um, I have been in an elevator in my very university in the inner city in which I work. And I say this story very often as an example, because it always is jarring to me where I was going up to teach a class, two back-to-back -back classes, a 4.30 and a 7. I'm getting in my game space. It's the first day of classes. And I recognize another teacher who I've met, who's a full-time professor at a, at a faculty meeting. And I remember introducing myself to her. We had a conversation. And it's okay. She didn't remember me in the moment or whatever the case is. See, making excuses for why it happened. I'm just trying to model for you how this works. Um, and as I'm sitting, I'm standing in the elevator, she goes, oh, is it your first day of class? And I'm still not catching on. And I said, yes, it is. And she says, um, oh, you're going to do great. How many more years do you have to go before you graduate? Now, some people might argue it's because of my genes and my mom has passed on this thing where it makes me look younger. But I would also argue that part of this is because I'm also a woman of color. I would also argue that there's something about who I am, how I stand, how I speak, what I was wearing that led her to believe in no way, shape or form could I be her peer. And how do I know that? And, and people of color, you're probably resonating with me um, because not everything is about race for us either. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes it's just, oh, it was a misunderstanding. And other times you get that feeling go over you where it's freeze, a frozen feeling, a trauma response feeling, a here we go again feeling, yeah? Um, so it's important that we understand, right? That there could be racial harassment and hostility. And that's what we think of when we think of racism. Many of us go to KKK members, right? Many of us go to like, violence um, physically. But as one of my white allies and organizers and friends, Bonnie Cushing has said from PSAB, she goes, even if we have removed in some hypothetical world, all KKK members, all people that are obviously bigots, would racism still exist? Would racism still be a problem? Would we still suffer from race-based traumatic stress? And the answer to that, I think many of you would say is yes. And that is what we are talking about. That is what I've been talking about for the last few slides, that they're not just individual acts of racism that our youth, that our families, that you may be struggling from, right? But there are also systems in place to ensure um, that some of this continues as is, yeah? Um, so if you look also and you move along, you'll see that Encounters with racism are, and how they're experienced also depends on many, many factors, right? It depends on someone's background. So someone could be um, black identified and say that didn't bother me at all. That doesn't negate the pain, the stress and the overwhelm of the person that experienced it. It would be for those of us, all of us that work with trauma because what we're talking about is being trauma informed, yeah? What we're speaking about in systemic oppression and white supremacy, racism, race-based traumatic stress, what we are talking about is being trauma-informed, yeah? So as this gentleman says on this slide, you know, systemic racism is a public health crisis, yeah? Um, this affects every single one of us. So some of the trauma symptoms that are associated with systemic oppression and systemic racism and inequality, um, it's connected also to health issues. As we know, there are lots of people that were turned away in hospitals um, from bed Brownsville, Brooklyn, Harlem, you know, people from Jersey City, Newark, turned away, told, you're okay, you know, it's all right, we don't have a test for you, especially those crucial first months. And my heart goes out to all of you that have lost someone that you care about, including families or and people that you have worked with as clients or students. Um, because the reality is, is that there's a deep connection between public health, mental health, 
an overall medical health industrial system. And it is important that we understand that the pain of people of color is often minimized. It is often pathologized. Yes, mental health professionals, right? ODD, OCD, um, these, are, these are all uh, oppositional defiant, I didn't mean to say OCD, oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, often being diagnosed, and there's tons of research to support this, right? Um, to many black and brown youth, um, as opposed to trauma diagnoses. So these are ways that we can do it different. And I will get to that in just a bit. Um, but just to follow through with this slide, um, what I think it is important that you see is that discrimination affects many of us and it affects people of color's mental health. Okay, deep breath. <laughs> So now, as I told you, these are overviews. I'm doing my best to pull through. So I'm gonna get a little faster, believe it or not. And we're gonna talk just a bit and we're gonna rewind. We started out with the present and now I'm bringing you back um, a couple, many, many, many hundreds of years to like, well, how did we get here? Like, this, this is a mess. I know that there's a lot of allies out there and people of color saying like, okay, then what do we do about this? And what I need to say is, as Nipsey Hussle and many others have said, this is a marathon. This is not a sprint, right? This is not a one shot deal, my people. This is something that we have to slowly and methodically work on together. This isn't a black person's issue. This isn't just a Mexican identified person's issue. This isn't just a disabled mother with mental health issues issue. This is our issues as providers. This is part of our code of ethics to give equitable treatment, yeah? And that includes understanding a person's history, right? That, so what I'm about to talk about is colonization, right? And how it has affected us, mind, body, and spirit. Whether it has dehumanized us, if our people have been colonizers, right? Because it's dehumanizing. Yeah, we have to get our humanity back. Or whether it has dehumanized us as people that have been oppressed. So colonization is when a dominant group or system takes over and exploits or extracts resources, even minerals, coffee, bananas, rice from a land and its native people. Make no mistake, colonization has taken place all over the globe. And this can occur through many of the things as you see there, trigger warnings. Some of those are very triggering. Um, but they're also part of history. You know, I've sat with youth and I've learned with organizations where there's 10 year olds talking about this and they have a better grip and an understanding about the history and able to process it, maybe more so than some of us as adults. Yeah, we have been conditioned to feel like I'm not supposed to talk about, this is too much, this is too heavy. Um, but what about the people holding this in their bodies unconsciously all the time? You know, so um, decolonizing is about reclaiming what was taken and honoring what it is we still have in the present. Um, so this map is just a brief overview of European colonial empire. So this is so that you can see throughout the world. I'm a visual learner. I don't know if everybody else is a visual learner, hence my colorful slides. Um, from England to France to Portugal to Spain, Netherlands, Denmark, uh, Russia, we can keep going. Uh, look at all of Central America, the Caribbean. Um, I just finished doing a presentation for Cayman Islands Psychological Institute um, who is still under British rule. So that was a different conversation, yeah? Um, so understanding that colonization um, has played out and continues to play out. Oops, sorry about that. Um, I also wanna say that colonization is a form of trauma. Um, and I did not create this beautiful art. This was done by Nerdy Brown Kid, <laughs> that is their name, hashtag. Um, so many of us are talking about this. This is not a Dr. Mullen issue. Um, I have a resource for you at the very end where um, I am, I'm, his name is escaping me right now, but he's a Jamaican psychiatrist that has been talking about decolonizing mental health, unbeknownst to me, for the last 30 years of his career throughout Jamaica, throughout Puerto Rico, throughout what is known as the island of Hispaniola, all across Britain, you name it. That's not something I learned in my graduate studies, have you? Um, so I think it's important that we understand that the world has been trying to have this conversation, um, but there has been some systems in place that have told us 
that we shouldn't have these conversations. Um, so it's essential that we begin to look at decolonizing our ways as mental health staff, right? Because colonization burns us out. Capitalism fatigue burns us out. Working two, three jobs, right? Trying to make ends meet. When the living wage might be $25 for two individuals in a household, but the minimum wage is what? Nine, $10, $11. Um, so it makes it impossible for families to really catch up whether they migrated to this country or whether they've been in this country for a long time. Um, so many of these communities, the, the trauma reenacted, the colonization as trauma may look like other things that we have seen. And some of you may be saying, well then how do I know it's this? And what I would say to that is we can't do a check off box. It isn't like just looking into the DSM-5 and saying, ah, okay, that is, um, attention deficit disorder with hyperactivity. It is really essential that we start to get to know the background and the history and that understand that the communities that we work with may not even recognize it themselves, okay? And also emotional decolonization and colonization is something that I talk about a great deal. Um, there are emotional ramifications to having our land, our people, our customs, our ways of engaging, our religions ripped from us, yeah? And so that's why many black Americans often feel like, what, what is home, yeah? Unless you're connected, unless you have family in Panama or Brazil or you know Jamaica or Grand Cayman, you may feel a bit disconnected unless you have done some of this work to reconnect. Thank you, Dr. Hinkling, unless you reconnect to this energy. So as therapists and helping professionals, we are responsible for identifying the signs and helping clients to acknowledge their emotions, including the effects of colonization. And so emotional colonization is an internalization of beliefs, of emotions affecting many people of color. Um, and it can lead to feelings of despair, deep loss, absolute overwhelm. So this leads us to a term that is coined by Dr. Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart. Again, I don't know if many of you have learned about these amazing researchers in your graduate programs or any of your schools, um, but it is really, really essential that we start highlighting some of these brilliant theorists and academics. Um, so unresolved historical grief, I think that many of us, if we sit back and think of some of the people that we're working with and some of the communities and families, who of us are not affected by unresolved historical grief, yeah? So it doesn't mean that we're diagnosing any of these things. We don't need to diagnose racial trauma per se right now, right now. We don't need to diagnose unresolved historical grief or emotional colonization. What we do, what I'm begging you to consider is that we make more space for these conversations in healthy ways. And that's another workshop uh, and SCA will talk to you about that um, after I'm done. But these conversations come up gently. They're not always obvious. It's, you know, when people talk about a deep grief, um, deeply grieving the death of, of George Floyd, of Breonna Taylor, Sandra Bland, Trayvon Martin. You know, some of us may say like, well, okay, I don't get it. Like you really didn't know them. You didn't know Prince. You didn't know Nipsey Hussle. I was sitting in a group with 20 something year olds sobbing about Nipsey Hussle, you know, sobbing. This came up for three weeks straight. And it's because it is also, we're connected, right? There is somebody that also represented, you know, something bigger than us, somebody that looked like they're living their highest and best self, that they're living a life that, wow, you got out of it. You remind me of me, or you remind me of my cousin, you remind me of my husband. And I dare say that there's some of this unresolved historical grief, grieving for another one of your people, grieving for someone else that was just living the life and then their life was taken short or they weren't living the life. They were just trying to survive, right? Selling Lucy's and then their life was taken drastically um, and, and, and violently in front of a lot of people. So historical trauma is a cumulative effect emotionally and psychologically. Um, and is wounding over the lifespan and across generations. And it emanates from massive group crisis, trauma, and stress, right? So legacies of genocide. So if anybody identifies as Navajo from a Sioux Indian, First Nations, Lenape, you know, when we talk about land, reservations are not land. They're, they're not 
vital with crops growing and forests and rivers and trees, you know, our native people were given the leftovers, the scraps, because folks had reservations about them. Think about the word reservation and where that comes from. Yeah, when we think of our Jewish siblings and you think of the Holocaust, the violence there, right? And how that gets passed on from generation to generation. The Armenian genocide, we don't talk about these things, yeah? We could keep going and we can keep talking about various genocides and violence as well as the institution of slavery in the United States. These are all legacies of genocide and colonization that continue to have violent effects on our people. Um, so this here is, um, oops, sorry about that. This is slow and then fast, sorry about that. Um, this here is a brief video on, on the transatlantic slave trade and why I bring this up here and now. Um, you're not hearing anything, you're just going to see it. Um, I think that this is really powerful. Actually, an 18-year-old student, because I'm telling you, our youth get it. <laughs> They're very, very politicized and conscious, which is why many of us need to catch up with them. Um, so this is going to depict, if it loads, um, all of the Atlantic slave trade routes starting from about 1550. And as you see, I don't know if you could see it. Sorry for those of us that some uh, visual issues. There's a little dot and you will continue to see these dots accumulate. Notice where they're going. Notice where they're coming from. So it is really, really essential that between 1525 and 1866 that we understand that 12.5 million Africans were captured and sold during what we see as the transatlantic slave trade. Let us make no mistake um, that 5.3 million, my people, were sent to the Caribbean. So for those of us that just have this disconnect, no, 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 I'm not Black, I'm not African. <laughs> yeah, um, 4.86 million were sent to Brazil. Yeah, 450,000 were sent to North America. That's only 5%. So when we, that's a whole other conversation that we don't have space and time for, but we also need to look at the anti-Blackness that is prevalent within our Latinx communities. Yeah, we need to look at the ways in which Latin America and, and those of us from Latin countries are disconnected from our Blackness. Um, and what that is exactly about and how that often plays out. Um, I also think it is really important um, that we begin to look at the ways in which the history of slavery continues to affect us today. One of my favorite books and one of my favorite role models is Dr. Joy DeGru. Um, she's written Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome. If you have not already read or purchased Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, I highly suggest you do. Um, something that I offer when I do consulting to organizations is taking a book like Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, which is heavy on emotional content, but a light read in terms of everybody being able to digest it and understand it. And she talks about the ways that history of slavery for our black, for black identified people or for people that have been, and that were enslaved Africans in their history, that there are these three um, identities or symptoms for lack of a better word. And one of them is vacant esteem. Um, these are feelings of pervasive hopelessness, depression, and general self-destructive outlook that are not necessarily just a major depressive disorder or dy dy dysthymia. And that's the thing, that the DSM does not necessarily capture post-traumatic slave disorder right? Syndrome, I'm sorry. Um, the DSM does not capture emotional colonization. The DSM does not capture unresolved historical grief. And so we begin to perpetuate some of this violence on our communities, unbeknownst to us, not on purpose, yeah? And I know we say, well, what do we do? Insurance companies. I know, but these are conversations we need to start having. These are conversations that we need to look at. Ever-present anger, right? The people protesting, the people demanding justice, right? This is what happens when there's a block goal. I speak about rage a great deal in my work on social media on decolonizing therapy because rage can also be sacred. Not the rage where we're hurting someone, where we're taking their life, but the rage that is ancestral, 
right, that is related to violence against our bodies. When you think about the institution of slavery in the US or in Brazil or anywhere else, what you can begin to think of are how bodies were used as labor. And when you think about how hard so many people, how hard people of color work. When you think about how hard people of color have to go above and beyond to show that they're not lazy or to get that raise or to be heard or seen, it is quite exhausting, yeah? Um, so also racist socialization and internalized racism. She talks about these three symptoms as a way to say that these are symptoms reflective, right? Of the experience of someone that has once has a history or a lineage of um, being an enslaved African or individual. So I always like this quote and I always wanna put it here in bold. Slavery was more than just a labor system. It influenced every aspect of colonial thought and culture. The humans were trafficked and colonized. They endured misery, violent labor practices, loss of community, family, Pri privation and land. Enslaved people strove to adapt and rise up against spirit and emotional, of course, physical deaths by forming collectives, communities, our people, yeah? Slavery became a building block of America's economy um, and slavery actually, if we look at the history, became America's finest financial asset. Um, I do not have um, a lot of time here, so I wanna be really conscious. Um, I'm gonna see if I can show you just a minute. This is a beautiful overview of intergenerational trauma um, from an Aboriginal perspective so that we understand that it happens all across the world, not just in our lives. Um, okay, let's see if this gets going. If not, I will move on and just explain it best myself. Just give us a couple of seconds here. Okay. It's taken a little bit long and I wanna honor our time. So I'm gonna move on. Um, I, I definitely suggest watching this animation. It's really great. Um, what I do wanna say oops, about intergenerational trauma, what I do want to say about intergenerational trauma is that it is also um, a landmark and it is historical. We can see it within somebody's well-being. And let me give you an example here for just a second. Yeah, let me just give a quick example. Um, so oftentimes I will work with someone and they will be talking about their pain, their overwhelm, their sadness. Um, I just tired of living paycheck to paycheck. My mom lived in this way. My dad lived in this way. My grandfather was barely making end meet. Um, there, there was this deep, deep sense and feeling of overwhelm of no matter what I do, and I'm working hard, I've been doing this, Dr. Mullen, I've been doing this, I've been working on this, I've been working on my trauma history, on my sexual abuse history, Dr. Mullen, you know, we've been working together for three years, and there's still this pervasive sense that there's something hanging over me. There's still this sense as though like, I'm not gonna beat this family curse. Sometimes that's how I hear it from the people I serve, is that this is, like a curse. And I inquire, you know, tell me a little bit about, about this curse. Like, let's just say hypothetically, a curse, right? We go with it, right? Clinicians, right? We go with it. Let's just say it is a curse in some way, shape or form. Would you tell me a little bit about what that looks like? Like, what's, what does that feel like in your family? And then we start unpacking the family history. And then eventually something will come up around, yeah, well, you know, my people struggled in Haiti. Yeah, you didn't know that? Like, and then we'll get into history and culture or being a Black person or being a, a El Salvadorian person or being, and that is the in. That is the in and that is letting us know, right? From This is me, 16 years of realizing this and doing this. But even if the person is not conscious, conscious of it, their unconscious, right, is letting us know that there is something here and that this is a time for us to have conversations. It doesn't mean we start saying, oh, yeah, let's talk about Donald Trump. Irrelevant, actually. Colonization is deeper than that. And so is systemic inequities and racism, much deeper than him, although problematic, much deeper than him. We are talking about systems. So we also look at the collective unconscious. Collectively, everybody is, you're hearing them say, waking up, right? So even if people were not comfortable with these conversations before, we're more ready to have these conversations because it's in our face how drastically violent things are, how unfair, and um, 
how scary it's becoming in our world and country. So these hallmarks of intergenerational and historical trauma, <clears throat> excuse me, although historical trauma are about historical events and that being passed down in our body, mind, spirits, and attitudes and beliefs, intergenerational trauma are actions, behaviors, habits passed down from maybe our great, great, great grandparents, survival techniques, hitting, right? Um, I talk about that a lot as a consultant. A lot of times they're like, you know, I have this, this parent that's great, but they keep beating their kid. And I'm not minimizing the beating of the kid, but that's also passed down from days of slave practices as well, right? Not just slave, but I'm just using as an example to talk about the black community, <clears throat> excuse me, because we often hear that. The black mother, the enslaved African mother, right? Our people were also trying to save our youth on plantations. So I might have to hit you to get you in line so that you don't get murdered, so that you're not lynched, right? And so that gets passed down and these practices get passed down. And I hear this all the time, right? I have family members like, you know, if I, if I don't do A, B, C, and D, my kid is gonna go off track and then the cops are gonna arrest him. He's gonna be part of the system or he's gonna die. And feeling that fear, having that conversation, if you have black children, is something that is normal across black communities. That is not something that the white community has to do is tell their teenage son, listen, listen to me. If a cop pulls you over, if you and your boys are doing something, that is a conversation that black and brown families need to have with our kids all the time. And um, that is a hallmark of the intergenerational historical trauma. And some of the ways that shows up are through addiction, suicide, pain, when we're in so much pain, right? This loss of self and identity. These are all the ways that this continues to show up and affect us. I'm just moving along because of time. Um, and I always like to ask around this period, can you take a breath for me? It's a lot, right? I don't want you to take this into your bodies either, which we do all day, all day, but how do you feel? And this is okay to ask in our staff meetings and our clinical supervisions. Um, I ask the people that I consult with all the time, you know, um, you know, where are you? Are you present in your body? How do you feel? How do you feel in your mind? How does your heart feel? Many times I'll hear, have people tell me, I don't know, numb. I'm not in my body. That is, that's telling us something, right? That's a hallmark of exactly what I'm speaking of which are the effects of colonization, intergenerational trauma, and historical trauma. It deeply affects us. So just tidbits. These are just tidbits of some of the practice and things I would like for you to consider. So D is for decolonize. <laughs> so moving towards a more decolonized therapeutic frame. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. So in doing that, I need to point out um, the amazing, amazing work um, of adverse, the adverse childhood experiences. Yeah. Um, our attorney general, she's absolutely amazing and so important that we understand that the ACEs score, and if you're not familiar with ACEs, I'm sure you are when we look at trauma, um, ACEs is groundbreaking. It is groundbreaking. Um, and it's important to look at adverse childhood experiences and how it has affected the people in which we're serving, right? So this includes physical, emotional, sexual abuse, neglect, um, being in a household with a mentally ill caregiver. Um, that is also massive and affects us deeply as well, right? Um, so it is important um, that we begin to look at a difficult childhood um, as a threat for many of the people that we serve and the youth that we serve, and that this connects to their activated amygdala, um, poor impulse control and judgment, um, an activated stress response, and then this then leads to an activated immune system, right? And then that also leads to inflammation, right? And when we think of inflammation, right, then we're looking at chronic disease, um, even diabetes, um, we're also dealing with a great deal of pain. Um, so look, here is the updated version of the historical trauma. Then we go to community experiences, adverse child experiences, 
then how it affects the disrupted neurological development and the biology of the child, let's say cognitive impairment, then the adoption of the health risk, the behavior, the coping, distress, disease, disability, and then it could, could lead to early death, or I would say incarceration or early behaviors that many of us do not want, right? Um, and then we're also dealing with microaggressions, racism, implicit bias, the intergenerational trauma, which would be the epigenetic piece, right? And over here, then we have, yeah, this is just the life course leading towards so conception all the way through. So I love this because this also includes the historical trauma. Um, I also want to go back because it's just calling to me. So I also want to go back and just show a little bit, if we can, of uh, Phil Roundtree's work. Um, I don't know if anyone on the tech side can help me with this. Um, Phil Roundtree talks a lot about what it's like living in his um, body, mind, and spirit as a Black man with depression. Um, I do believe that this conversation is important, vital, and necessary. Um, it also appears as though um, it is really important that we understand that depression affects all people, even when individuals may look like it doesn't bother them or they have it together. I'm not going to be able to get through the whole thing, but um, I've shown this on many keynotes and um, oh, oh. When you look at me, what do you see? Now I'm gonna go through some of the things that I typically hear. To the very astute, I usually get I'm black, I'm bearded, and I'm strong. I also get I look like NBA superstar James Harden. I'm most definitely the poorer version. <laughs> I get hip hop superstar, Emmy Award winner, Donald Glover, AKA Childish Gambino. Yeah, that too, right? <laughs> and last but not least, I get Curtis Jackson, AKA 50 Cent. Now, one of my goals is definitely to give Richard die trying. I think Sally May is putting the emphasis on or die trying, right? But see, what I don't hear is Phil, you look like somebody that lives with depression and anxiety. Phil, you look like somebody that was suicidal for 15 years every day, five to six times a day. They don't say, Phil, you look like somebody that was driving on Interstate 95, wanting to crash your car to end your life. No, because see, here in America, when we think about mental health, we think about the homeless man who's walking the streets, talking nonsensically to himself. We think about the, the white celebrity who takes their life via suicide. We think about the, the white mass murderer who goes into a high school and takes the lives of innocent children. Or it's usually your president who loves to tweet venom from the hip. But see, rarely does the conversation speak of a father of two kids someone who possesses a master's in exercise science, a master's in social work, somebody pursuing a doctorate. Rarely is it a person of color. Rarely is it a black man like myself until now because black mental health matters. Now you may be asking yourself, what is black mental health and why is it differentiated amongst racial and ethnic? So we're gonna stop this here. It's an excellent um, video. Feel free to check it out. Um, again, in the interest of time, I'm gonna stop it. But Dr. Phil, I mean, I'm sorry, he's not a doctor, but Phil Roundtree um, does amazing work. He's a clinician. He runs men groups um, for other men of color. Um, and please check out the whole YouTube. It's really, really powerful. Um, I also, I'm sorry, I, I've been having these brain stops. Um, also, the creator of the ACES study is Dr. Nadine Burkharis. So I failed to mention that. So I wanted to be sure that I did. Um, so I would dare say that it could be quite violent for us to treat mental illness. Notice I use the word treat, right? To treat mental illness without looking at the interlocking systems of oppression that I was speaking about earlier in our workshop 
um, that many of us were raised within and on. So inequity is violent. Lack of access to basic needs and services is violent. And the personal is political. So um, I did a workshop yesterday and somebody said to me, personal is political. Are we talking about Democrats and Republicans? And I, and I had to laugh because it's like, everything is political, right? And I remember being told in my graduate courses, Jennifer, no, 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 you can't do work around slavery. And you can't do work on how it relates to inner city youth now. Like that's too political. You're a psychologist, you're a therapist, like you're not political. And I realized that that was a bit of like a, a microaggression against me because he didn't quite understand that my very existence is political. Your existence is political, right? Whether or not our mother had access to clean water and healthcare when she was pregnant with you is political, right? Whether or not people are living on the streets, whether or not they have Wi-Fi for their child to do class at, during a time of a pandemic is political. Right? Whether or not we have enough money for clean running water is political. All of this is political. All of it is political, but it doesn't become political if your level of privilege just makes it feel like, well, this, you know, everybody has this. And if you don't have this, then you're lazy or you're not working as hard because my family came here with nothing. And I would say to that, that that is not necessarily true. Yes, families may have come here without nothing, but white privilege or light skin privilege has its abilities and, and, and ways to get us through some dark times. So that's another workshop. So in order to really wrap up and get to the decolonizing and the, the politicizing our practices, again, I said marathon, just like undoing racism, this is a long-term thing, but this doesn't mean we shouldn't get involved and address it more. This just means that we are the ancestors. We are the ones, my good people, that have to start applying this frame first to our own lives, internalize it, and then we can start doing this work with the people that we're serving. So capitalism's mantra is get rich, get ahead by any means necessary. And the problem with that mantra is that it continues to oppress people that are at or below the poverty level, right? And that might not even be some of us. We have privilege of not being at or below the poverty level, but some of us are a paycheck away, make no mistake from being broke. So this does relate in many ways. So cultural competence and no offense to anybody. And I just wanna say that I never try to come across what offense, but cultural competence, diversity, multiculturalism, they're like a flesh colored band-aid. <laughs> you know, like they, they, they're, they, they don't address the root causes of oppression and colonization, which is, I'm trying to get real about what it is we need to be more conscious of. So thereby that continues to transmit the intergenerational historical wound. So we are part of creating change. I created this a couple of, maybe a couple of years, a month ago. Or so. Um, so we sit in lit sessions, listening to the effects and symptoms of oppression and we aren't supposed to do something productive about it. You mean to tell me that I was trained to diagnose a condition but not collaboratively heal a human. So I would like for us to bring healing back into our treatment. That doesn't mean that you're not healing and you're not healing and you're not healing. That doesn't mean that we don't have some amazing mental health workers and behavioral health workers here. We do. And we need to teach this in different ways as well. So um, be a critical lover of your profession and your institution and where you work. That doesn't mean being critical and negative and not offering any changes and helpful things, but here are some questions that I constantly work with with my staff and the organizations in which I'm consulting with, right? So who do you serve? Who do you really serve? Who are the policy serving? What do the students or the poor folks you're treating or the clients need that they're not receiving from your services? And sometimes I just wanna say, we don't have the money to provide these things, but how do we start to you know, put our people power to advocate and ask for these things more. If one person asks for them or two people ask for them, they will get pulled out or fired. So this is why we need us, community, to make this work happen. It cannot be done in isolation. These systems know how to pick us apart and take us out and burn us out when we try to do it alone. Um, where is the funding being allocated and why? Asking for transparency, right? Who decides standards of practice? 
Who decides that? I want to know. I mean, even with needs assessments, who gets to decide what need I have? And even if you're asking me, am I being honest with you about the needs that I have, right? Um, in what ways have you been desensitized to the inequality around you? This is just how it is. I'm used to it. Yeah, um, we're used to it. And then we're slowly dying inside. We're getting sick all the time. We wonder why we have this bronchial infection every other week. I'm not being critical. I'm saying I'm with you. That has been me. I've had to go under medical leave because I was pushing myself into the ground. Um, in what ways have you been discouraged to ask questions? That's a warning sign. And are the services to our communities accessible? Um, are we giving them what it is they need? Are, are there, is there access? So decolonizing is also not, wait, I just wanna make sure I didn't skip one. Decolonizing is not just intellectual, it is also deeply spiritual. It's heart work. So many of the people that we serve or maybe many of us are also spiritual. And I don't just mean overarching Christianity. I'm saying that there's all these other different kinds of spiritualities and belief systems that can be brought into the therapeutic work to help people connect to their ancestry, their lineage, and who they are. So in wrapping up, here are some resources. Some of these are a bit more heady. Um, so if people wanna know more about decolonization, um, Tuck and Yang's decolonization is not a metaphor is excellent. If you wanna know about epigenetics, that's a great one. More about psychology and, and um, colonization and oppression. Um, revolution in psychology is excellent. Um, why settler privilege is so hard to talk about, as you know, as I honored the land that we're on, um, this is directly related to that. These are great current reads. If anybody just wants to go on Amazon, pick up a book, the stuff that I'm reading that is lighting me up and reminding me the stuff that I'm talking about in my organizing circles and with the students that I'm serving, this is it. These are the books. Um, so Me and White Supremacy by Leila Saad is, a, is an amazing black Muslim woman who's written and she has a workbook. So if you identify as a white person, that is a great start. Hood Feminism is excellent by Nikki Kandel. So you wanna talk about race, Ijoma Olu, um, Eloquent Rage by Brittany Cooper. Um, they're all black women. Um, My Grandmother's Hands by Rezma Menekem. Um, he, he's a black man, he, he talks about somatics, trauma, and white bodied and black bodied trauma. And he coined that term, I believe, white bodied and black bodied. And um, a lot of people are really digging it in the organizing community. Do Better, Spiritual Activism for Fighting and Healing from White Supremacy by Rachel Ricketts. White Fragility, many of you might've heard of that by Robin D'Angelo, as well as White Rage by Carol Anderson and Pamela Gibson. Um, final thoughts. This is a call to action. Emotional health is impossible when living in systems of oppression. This is not just for our clients, this is also for us. We cannot effectively treat diseases, I don't like to call them diseases, such as depression and anxiety without first addressing the systems that make these mental health issues so prevalent. We must redefine the scope of helping professionals and the work of mental health to not only include individual trauma sensitive treatment, which I'm sure you're doing now, but just helping to dismantle, at least in therapy and counseling and behavioral health, the systems of oppression that create conditions of illness. Yeah? So we can't just decolonize in here and use big words. It is an action. It's a process. So we must integrate with spirit, with earth, with each other, right? Um, and, and ourselves, we must continue to decolonize. Yeah? And so it is. So I have talked a great deal for the last hour and a half, likely. Um, feel free to find me on Instagram. I will be around here. I believe that I'm gonna hand this over now to the care team, um, but here is some of my information if you need to reach out. I will also be around for the question and answer. Um, so thank you. Thank you for being present, for listening, for being willing to go to your growing edge, even if the conversation was uncomfortable. Thank you. Dr. Melinda, thank you really goes to you. Thank you for such an inspiring conversation, a hard conversation and for um, challenging us to be critical of our organizations and our practices and the work that we do and to just be aware of who we are and what we bring to the services that we provide to our clients and acknowledging the role that all of this has played on us as providers as well. And thank you for just encouraging us to continue having hard but courageous conversations 
I'm going to give everyone a three minute break. If we could come back at 1134, we'll begin our Q&A session. Please remember to drop your questions in the chat. We'll be selecting people to speak directly to Dr. Mullen and ask you their questions and enjoy a three minute break. All right, so welcome back from the break, everybody. But before we jump into the Q&A, um, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Christina Calabrese. I am the Vice President of SCO's Center for Professional Development um, and an advisor with our CEO, Keith Little, for our care uh, team. And so we just wanted to run through some quick community agreements before we did um, the Q&A. 
So just a reminder to be respectful, uh, particularly we have a lot of um, not just SEO staff, we have um, family potentially and community partners as part of our discussion today. So let's keep that in mind and make sure if we want to use specific examples that we're not using any identifying information. Um, remember that no one knows everything and together we know a lot. So we are here to learn from one another. Uh, and so we make sure that one person speaks at a time and we want everyone to actively participate. So if you have questions, put your hand up, put it in the chat. We wanna hear from everybody. Uh, and we will continue to use the Ouch Oop model that we've used in other care talks and in a lot of our trainings. So if you feel hurt or offended by another participant's comment, that person can say, ouch, and in an acknowledgement, the person who made the comment says, oops. And if necessary, we can have a further dialogue about the exchange and help educate one another um, because we are here to help and support each other. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Tracy and Danielle uh, for some questions for Dr. Mullen. Thank you, Christina. Also, I wanna say, as you call on people, please be sure to mention your organization. As you mentioned earlier, we have a lot of different organizations on here today and we wanna acknowledge everyone. The first question I have is from Elise. Let's see if we can highlight her. Just give us a few seconds. We have a lot of participants. Hi. You should be able to unmute yourself now. I did. There you are. There I am. <laughs> Good morning. You uh, you said you had a question. Well, I put a question in the chat. Um, it was, um, how do we best respond when we notice an act of microaggression? And is the response to the, to the aggressor, the aggressee, or both? Can hear. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry. Hi, Elise. Thank you so much for asking your question. Um, yeah. Um, often when there is a microaggression that has occurred, so it sounds like you would be the person witnessing it. Yeah. That's yes. what you're saying. That like yes. you've witnessed something happened and it's like, oh. Um, so it depends. I, I it honestly would depend on the situation. I would constantly be more aware of the person who we believe received it, right? So as we know with a microaggression, it isn't about intent, it's about impact, right? So it's really about how the person received, received it. So if it was three or four of us or a number of us sitting at a meeting and I heard something happened, A, is it safe enough for me to say, oh, um, I'm sorry, what did you mean by that? Or could you say a little bit more? That's one of my favorites. <laughs> could you say more about that? Or oh, what, what does that mean? Or if I have a relationship with a person and we're cool, like, what does that mean? That doesn't sound right. Or that doesn't sit well with me. So that is a way to sort of say, I don't appreciate that. And I don't like that. And then maybe this person would say, oh, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Because either they're embarrassed or mm -hmm. maybe there's a power differential or a dynamic between them and the person. Um, if that is not safe or comfortable to do it in the moment, I would always go speak to both separately. If it really does sit with you, if you feel like it is something that continues to happen and is problematic, but you always want to do so with that person's permission. Does that, does that make sense? Yes, um, very much And if so. it continues to happen and that person says it's not a big deal, but you've noticed this other person impart this harm to many people, mm. um, what the research says and what I highly recommend is that a conversation still happened with a person that made the microaggression. Like, hey, I noticed that you keep making this thing and telling these people that, oh, you're really smart or your people or those people, like you're making these comments and that's a microaggression. And that person may not be offended, but I'm offended. It hurts mm -hmm. me. So I wish, you, I wish you would stop or I wish you would consider a different word, something like that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for the question, Elise. Great question. We have another question from Jennifer Outlaw, if we can highlight her.
Hello, Dr. Mullen. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. I feel like it was so on point and um, I just received so much from it. So I really appreciate that. Um, my question was really uh, focused around um, the uh, push for ongoing evidence-based um, research and evidence-informed research. And the fact that um, often based upon uh, the work that you just talked about, a lot of our evidence-based models actually continue to further um, colonization and also can also support further trauma because they don't really address a lot of the things that you had just talked about. And um, just to share very quickly, you know, I'm a licensed clinical social worker and I, I find that um, I stopped practicing because of some of the things that you talked about. And also supervision is something that sometimes gets ignored or it's just an exercise in talking about a case versus a person and the person that's doing the treatment. So I just wanted to ask you, um, is, can you help us in terms of, or point us in the direction of how we can really um, start to look at models that may not go through the clearinghouse, but have a very uh, significant and healing opportunity for people of color, such as, you know, um, even talking about breath and, and other, um, you know, alternative um, practices by people of color. And I'm just wondering, can you point us in a direction um, so that we can start integrating some of these practices and principles into our work? Yeah. Well, number one, thank you, Jennifer. Um, very, very appreciative for your feedback. And this is this is the question, right? This is, this is an essential question. Um, here, here's the thing. Um, what I've been realizing is that there is a great deal of openness to the conversations lately, but the implementation and the shift of practices and not necessarily discarding and throwing out the evidence-based practices, but not highlighting them as key or looking at them as supplementary, right? right? Not necessarily like the main work. Um, that becomes an issue because of funding. That becomes an issue because whoever the funding, whether it's grants, state, federal, often wants to see evidence-based practices. Um, so what, where I'm noticing shifts are in smaller organizations, to be quite frank with you, in some even community practices and nonprofits that are attempting to take some of the work of Dr. Joy DeGruleri, for example, like literally take post-traumatic slave syndrome and apply that to their population. Um, so there's three small practices um, and I can definitely like send a list along after this workshop. I, at the top of my head, I can't remember where they're located, um, but they're starting to do this work. In DC, there's two places, but we're talking about maybe not more than a dozen that I'm aware of that are really looking at the harm that sometimes evidence-based practices enact with our communities, right? Because we're not looking at the larger historical aspect or the environmental aspects that are still affecting the people that we're putting back out there on the streets, right? Um, so I would also say definitely, and as someone reminded me, I think it's Dr. Fred, um, Frederick Hinkman, um, or Hinkerman, and I apologize because I'm just getting turned on to his work please dive into that because I'm just starting to read into what they've been doing in the Caribbean and how he as a psychiatrist has helped to start to decolonize mental health. So I'm just only a few pages into the book. It's brand new to me. Um, so yeah, the question is, if you're in a system or a community or an organization now, what I would recommend is first to sit down and say, let's say the CARES team, you know, for hypothetically, the care team comes together and a number of you are sitting down and saying, what are our communities not getting? We don't wanna do another survey. We don't wanna do another assessment. We don't like, what do we know from our sessions? What are we hearing from our groups? What are we hearing from on the residential units? What are we hearing? What do they need, right? Once we have that, it's sort of like a tree. Then we could branch out and say, who has that? 
What organizations can we partner with? Who can we bring in? Who are vendors that we need to bring in to provide this service? I notice um, I work with the New York City Division of Mental Health and Equity as well. I have a contract with them. So what we sometimes have to do is get our needs met through vendors. I hope that makes sense. I, you know, um, and what we often have to do is be creative. You know, and, and so. Some of the conversations happen offline. If you like, okay, I'm a therapist. Jennifer's a therapist, a licensed clinical social worker. What else does Jennifer do? What are the other ways? Are, can we bring yoga into right this group of youth that have just been incarcerated and we're, we're threatening to send them upstate? But how can we include trap yoga? Right. I'm, I've done it with, with my kids, right? <laughs> and they loved it. How can we bring goats in? You, you, you'll see a bunch of teenage boys start to squeal and get really happy. You know, how do we bring in this? How do we bring in that? Um, how do we bring in Dr. Mullen or someone like Dr. Mullen or this person or that person to have a conversation with these youth about what is occurring? Um, are we involving big brother and big sister? So sometimes it just looks like let's get the village centered, right? And some of your organizations may be doing that already but let's get the village centered. Let's hold this village. And then we can start to show other people that our model is doing something different, that we're trying something different. Um, there's also an, let me see if I get this right, an intergenerational trauma model, ITTM, and a small um, community practice out of Canada, right? Out of Canada. Um, I wrote, I interviewed a woman and I can, again, can't remember her name, too much information in my brain right now, but I'll get that for you. And look, ITTM, and they literally have an intergenerational trauma model that she, I believe now has gotten to be evidence-based, right? And there's two places in DC and one in California and South Central LA that are engaging in this work. And what that looks like is like getting parents and family in the door and then, you know, it might be like, okay, child is identified patient, but really, well, if we want to do this and we want to try out this model, you, parent, caregiver, I need you to be in this session, these sessions, four sessions, one-on-one. -on -one. And the client will, I mean, this child will be in sessions four times on their own. And then we have sessions with you together. And then we also provide them with worksheets and things that are nonverbal because we can't assume that all of our families and communities, you know, are, you know, are literate you know, or understand the language. And so they, there will be like sort of genograms where families and communities can start looking at, okay, what were some of the struggles that my mom went through? Did I know my mother? What were some of the struggles my father's history and family line went in? It starts bringing more awareness. Um, and I'm loving her model, to be honest. Uh, and then the last, and I know this is a longer conversation, but the last thing I want to say, Jennifer, and anyone else that this resonates with is I think that this is a time for us to be futuristic and creative. I, I'm just gonna keep it, you know, like when any of us working with youth know how boring it is for them to do what they've kind of always done, that they need to be challenged, which means we need to challenge ourselves to think outside as we were talking about these boxes that have collectively socialized us. So I would say there's a few people not doing it alone, that resonate in your community or even anybody on this on this um, this training and this workshop, you can be within different agencies and organizations, but coming together to create something different, just so that the families and the children are not bored and we're not bored, right? Because we're so much more than just therapists. And if we look back in the history of mental health, therapists were sometimes seen as the shamans. There were also the social workers. They were the, the we had different roles. We were not just doing talk therapy. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Thank you, Jennifer, for your question. Up next, we have Sahira Hamid. So here, are you there? I believe it's in the chat. Um. Oh. Okay, I am the school psychologist of the Tyree Learning Center. 
what would you say to those who ask how we can possibly be expected to stop racial bias since people will always have bias in some form? For example, some people have privileges or advantages that are seen as favorable, such as those that are slim, attractive, have hair, are friendlier, younger, et cetera. Yeah, um, so I'm getting this, this question seems like it's definitely about bias and for people that are saying that, um, I'm, just, I'm just reading it over to make sure I understand it. Um, how can we ex be expected to stop racial bias? Well, um, what I would say to that is I might reframe it. I, I don't know if it will ever be possible to stop bias or violence as a whole. Right. I'm hopeful, but uh, but I, I need to be realistic. I, I don't think it's just about stopping it. I really think it is about creating awareness, making sure that we're educated on how we're harming each other, even if it's un unintentional. The same way I believe Elise asked about microaggressions, like how do we microaggress or give micro assaults right on on each other on a consistent basis. Um, I also think it's important that we understand that bias is an internal process. So as long as mental health or counseling programs, social work programs, continue to see it as though there's a hierarchy and the therapist and the psychiatrist and those the psychologists are up here and the people are down here and that they need you, as long as that continues to be the frame and as long as we continue to highlight predominantly just Freud and uh, Karen Horney and, um, Aaron Beck, although great, I mean, there's there's great use and all, but as long as we continue to highlight just theory and some praxis and not our own internal work, and that includes work around our ancestry, that includes work around looking at our unearned privileges, that includes work around looking at our unconscious pathologizing practices with black bodies, black people. Um, that includes looking at, like you said, fat phobia, yeah, transphobia, we could keep going, ableism. What are the ways that the mental health system continues to perpetuate um, ableism? What are the ways that we say, oh no, you just need to work harder, but mom might be living with multiple comorbid interacting diagnoses and it's very difficult to get out of bed in the morning, Never mind take her child to school. Um, so really what I think we need to do is not just like convince people that bias can be eradicated or it can't. I think my humble opinion that it's more important to get in the work together. I think it's more important for us to take internal action and not just they're the problem, but how am I part of the problem too, right? And that's how I formed decolonizing therapy is like asking myself, how am I causing harm? Even if I think I'm not causing harm, how am I harming some of these people and youth? How am I harming my youth by threatening them to go upstate? How am I harming the youth by assuming that they're gonna do A, B, C, and D? You know, um, so I think we have to take responsibility for how we create bias and continue to microaggress on people. And then by that, um, we live by example and we can continue to unpack the bigger stuff. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. We have one more, well, we have two more questions. One being from Simon Laveau. Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, yes, thank you for your hard work, uh, Dr. Malone. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's needed in, in, in the world, not only in black communities or communities of color, but I think it's needed pretty much everywhere. My question is, uh, I wanted to know, uh, how does PTSS uh, impact uh, white people, if it does? Great question, Simon, thank you, yes. Um, so for those of you that might not be familiar, PTSS, we were just talking about post-traumatic slave syndrome, um, again, coined by Dr. Joy DeGruy Leary. Um, yes, great question, Simon. PTSS as, long, as well as anything that is colonizer related or historical trauma, um, oppression, all of it affects white people as well. Um, it dehumanizes white bodies and white people, right? Um, what often ends up happening is that there is, and we're generalizing, of course, so please just like go with me on this. Um, often what happens for white identified people 
is a sense of, well, either I have to be a really good ally and I'm gonna do everything I can to help this community. And that's great, that's nice. But are we turning the inquiry within self? Like are white people also having a look at oneself at the ways in which this could also be harmful, um, at the ways in which, um, and I don't know if you're familiar and I didn't go over it in this workshop. I do when I do the three part workshop, um, there's something called internalized oppression and internalize white supremacy, which is for white people. There's a section for people of color and there's a section where it manifestations of oppression for white body people. And some of those manifestations look like um, competitiveness. Again, not that all of us can't be competitive, but that level, um, some part is, um, you know, there's another aspect where it's sort of like externalizing, um, trouble relating and being emotional with the content or the people in which we're working with. So I could keep going on. Again, this is the whole, this is the whole workshop looking at internalized oppression. And again, these are just manifestations that can pop up like symptoms. Yeah. But I think that your question is so important because whiteness also has to be studied and investigated. The same way that um, the black community is looked at or Mexican children or Dominican children or the same ways in which we need to look at the ways that white supremacy and whiteness, which is what Dr. Joy DeGruyere is talking about, has affected white body people. Um, and some of the books that I recommended, I think do that really well, like the Me and White Supremacy, um, and the white rage, um, and what Robin D'Angelo's white fragility. Um, one of the other ways that I think specifically that it, white folks are affected by post-traumatic slave syndrome is, um, this guilt, this very deep guilt. Yeah. That, you know, well, well, did I do something? I didn't, this happened a long time ago, but I'm here trying to make it different. I'm a social worker. I'm a doctor. I'm a, you know, I'm doing my best to make it different. Um, but then when we're in a meeting, you know, if we're around a lot of people of color and a person of color is trying to be heard or they're being overlooked, then that's when we need our white allies, right? Like, or when a, a child is inappropriately being diagnosed or asked to be doing A, B, C, and D, that is when we could use some of our white allies or accomplices, as some people say these days, with power to jump in and sort of take the brunt of what's happening. Um, so yeah, I don't know if I've answered your question. I can go on probably for another hour, Simon, but <coughs> excuse me, white people are affected by this as well. Yes. Thank you for your question, Simon. Um, we have a last question from Mary Amor. Hi. Hi, Mary. Hi, thank you so much. This was life changing, no less than life changing. Mm -hmm. um, just wanting to put resources and energy into any organizations you come across. You've already probably answered my question. Um, just interested in mental health work, climate work from Jewish Board. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so was there, I'm sorry, maybe I missed the question. Is, Mary, was there a particular question? As you find any organizations that are really doing this, um, please continue to send them. You've already mentioned some and I'll pass that on. Bless you, thank you. Thank you, Mary. I will do so. Thank you, Mary. So Mary's question was again, um, if there were any organizations that she found especially effective, that you find especially effective in changing mental health systems, if you could just recommend that. Um, I wanna thank everybody for their questions. We see there are a few more questions in the chat. Unfortunately, we are at our time today. We wanna just make sure that you get the full content of our program today. We will be sending an email around post this event and meet with resources, and um, a recording of this presentation. So we'll just make sure that we add those resources and Dr. Mullen will connect with you to make sure that we can add in any extra resources that come to mind from the questions that were asked. 
Um, again, we want to thank you so much, Dr. Mullen, for your presentation. Again, it was inspiring and challenging. I want to thank all of our participants for staying with us today, for bearing with us today, and for being open to this conversation. We had a lot of different organizations. We had ACLD, SCO, Mercy First, ICL, Safe Horizons, Jewish Board. Um, if I'm forgetting anyone, please forgive me. There were a lot to remember. Please continue to post that. Um, we have a short video that we want to share with you. Please stay tuned. While uh, Danielle and Tracy queue up the video, we did want to um, ha have our president and CEO, Keith Little, uh, say a little something and thank everybody for their participation. So Keith, if you want to take it over, or Danielle, you might need to unmute Keith. Okay, I think we're good. Can you guys hear me? You're good, yep. Okay, great, great, great. So um, I'm kind of sitting here shaking my head and I think I'm either shaking my head yes or I'm shaking my head no. I, I did wanna just give a major thanks to Dr. Mullen. Uh, amazing presentation. Thank you for taking the time. And it really is good. We haven't formally met yet, but I'm looking to have some conversations in the future. So thanks for partnering with SCO and sharing your insights and your knowledge. Much appreciated. A major, major thanks to CARE team for another amazing CARE Talks. Every time they do a CARE Talks, they outdo themselves. So thank you guys for your work and, and more importantly, for your commitment. Very much appreciated. Also, thanks to SCO staff. When I came on, and I came on a little bit late, there were 215 participants, uh, a large portion of them SCO staff. Uh, and then I know there are other external organizations that are part of this. And I guess my message to you is thanks. You could have been doing something else, and you chose to be a part of this. So obviously, you believe in the work, and you're committed to it. So thanks for being a part of it. Um, I think about the last two and a half years on the journey for SCL. And it, at times I get outreach from people who are saying that they desire uh, to take training and education to practice. Here's an opportunity. I think what Dr. Mullen presented is an opportunity to take training to practice. Um, so use it. For the environment in which we live, it's a critical time for human services systems due to the impact of COVID, due to the impact of ongoing impact of structural and institutional racist practices and policies that negatively impact the people in the communities that we serve. But the other piece of it, it impacts us and our ability to provide services. So we need to keep that in mind as we move forward. Um, there's a lot of work we have to do. And I think to the extent we can continue to lay the foundation for that work through opening up our minds, opening up our hearts and opening up our spirits to the work, it's gonna benefit us. So I wanna thank each of you for being a part of this. And uh, I look forward to the next time for our CARE Talks. So I'm done. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Keith, again for that message. And again, thank you, Dr. Mullen. Um, we'll be playing a short video and we just ask that you contact us if you have any questions, feel free to hit us up in the CARE inbox. And we also have a five-part webinar series coming up in early 2021. If you enjoy this talk with Dr. Mullen, please stay tuned and look out for any emails from CARE. And again, as we leave you, thank you so much for joining us today. Watch the video.
I was always taught to be strong in this world. Told to never let my guard down because at any moment I could be attacked without a moment's notice that my skin made me a target. Skin that has persevered through many trials and tribulations from seeing my mama raped by landlords to my father being beaten and stripped of his manhood to my brothers and sisters being separated into jobs for this bigger system. My skin has always been under attack. Yet somehow we prevail through it all, through all the lynchings, literacy tests, new Jim Crow's war on drugs, the gentrifications, police brutalities, food deserts, mass incarcerations. We survived and adapted and pushed to change because our very existence depended on it. Our very existence depends on this, this black strength, Strength that has carried us for decades, but is undermining an important aspect of our humanity and feeding in on itself. Being strong all the time took away our ability to speak about our weaknesses, our sadness, our mental illnesses. This silence is killing us. On top of that, we lack proper mental health care access and endure mistreatments by medical professionals who cannot relate to us in their practice. On top of that, we stigmatize mental illness to preserve this place of our strength, damaging ourselves and among black children observing a spike in suicide rates, because they may feel that their place in heaven is way better than their place here today, because when black life isn't valued enough for professional help, adequate housing, or even breathing, life here degrades in value in comparison to life after. Black bodies. Strong black souls are floating through the wind, seamlessly letting go. Strong black bodies are screaming for help, but suffering in silence and being socially and systematically being put on quiet. Black souls are strong, but we do need help when we do fall through the cracks. That is why I want you to know that you can patch things up with me. All right, we can kick it back like it was a drive through movie in the 1970s. We can get some help from people who actually understand us, refute our standards of stigmatizing mental illness, and fight against the structures that chronically misdiagnose what this really is. Fight against the racism that brings up our mental health issues and lowers our treatment options, bringing us one step closer to seeing no other option. I want us to see that we have a way to heal this wound that has been widening ever since day one with no means of contracting. I want us to know that the seed that we sow today is the harvest we reap tomorrow. And when we finally reap, we can find peace in these moments, noticing that the danger isn't gone, but we finally have a place where it feels like it is, the grounding of black bodies.
Thank <laughs> you.